welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and development in modern Chinese culture, politics, economics, and social issues. My name is Shannon Tiazzi, and I will be your moderator for our program today. Today on China Forum, we will be discussing the implications of China's recent leadership transition, which took place during the 12th National People's Congress. We're happy to welcome two distinguished experts today to discuss this topic. We're joined by Dr. Douglas Paul, Vice President of Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Paul previously served as Vice Chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International from 2006 to 2008 and was an unofficial U.S. representative to Taiwan as director of the American Institute in Taiwan from 2002 to 2006. He was on the National Security Council staffs of Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush between 1986 and 1993 as Director of Asian Affairs and then as Senior Director and Special Assistant to the President. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Paul. It's a pleasure. We're also happy to welcome Dr. Bruce Dixon. Dr. Dixon is a professor at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, where he has taught since 1993. He is an expert on Chinese domestic politics who has published articles in Asian Survey, China Quarterly, and Comparative Politics. Dr. Dixon is the author of the book, Wealth into Power, The Communist Party's Embrace of China's Private Sector. Dr. Dixon, thank you for joining us as well. Happy to be here. In mid-March, China's government met in Beijing for the two sessions, the National People's Congress, the MPC, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC. Before we get into the precise details of what happened at this year's meetings, I'd like to invite both of you to give us a brief outline of what exactly these two sessions are, the functions and the responsibilities of the two meetings, the MPC and the CPPCC. So Dr. Paul, we'll start with you. Well, Bruce Dixon knows much more about this than I'll ever have known, but I would just say that the the party runs China, the Communist Party. They had meetings last fall. Uh, they have to then implement their supervision of the government, and that is done through a series of steps. A big one is the National People's Congress and the associated CPPCC meeting. Um, the latter much less important than the former. And they use this to put their new people in place. We're looking at the beginning of what will be five and maybe ten year terms for a lot of officials coming in. And uh, they start to inaugurate their programs of the new party leadership elected last November. Uh, you don't see a lot of detail on policy at this time. It's really framework setting for the next six months or so, and then there'll be a further party meeting where policy direction will be laid out more clearly uh, in presumably in next fall. Uh, the, the National People's Congress is essentially China's legislature. Um, and if you think of China, roughly speaking, as a parliamentary system, the ruling party drafts legislation, uh, nominates government officials who are then approved by the NPC. So the purpose of this session of the NPC was to basically approve all the party's nominees for the top government positions. Uh, parallel to that, or simultaneous to that, is this CPPCC which is largely a, a large-scale focus group. It doesn't have any authoritative power. It kind of deliberates, give advice. They consult with members of it. They're all appointed, sort of an honorary body. Um, exactly what it does, what role it plays, is kind of hard to say. It's sort of a distinctly Chinese um, institution. Uh, not much has been studied about it, but it always meets in tandem with, with the NPC from the national level to the local level. But beyond that, it's, it's largely an honorary body. And um, this year's MPC was especially important because the new leadership, which, as Dr. Paul said, will serve for five and even ten years, was appointed. But most of these figures were already introduced to us last fall at the National Party Congress. Could you just explain for our viewers a little bit about the different significances of these two appointments and why this new one um, has received so much attention? Well, the, the Chinese uh, government as a whole faces huge challenges of uh, redirecting their economy, sustaining growth, addressing demographic and environmental, other challenges, um, energy distribution, maybe just 
it's a, uh, as big a list as anybody in any government has in the world. And they have a, a new premier who's supposed to preside over a lot of this. The new party, the new party general secretary who became president of China in the NPC has been displaying his proclivities through a series of symbolic trips and statements since the party congress last November. With the NPC, the new premier who's going to run the economy begins to make his statements and issue his symbols of where he wants to take the government. And so people watch this very closely for hints of whether the promise of reform, which has been in the air from 2005, 2007 till now, can become reality of reform. And I think as a consequence of watching this latest meeting, we say it's too early to tell. Yeah, I think one little thing to add is that even though this is the, the NPC was the legislature, legislature, <laughs> legislature that met, uh, this is not sort of a checks and balances system. It's more a division of labor within the Chinese political system. Mm -hmm. So the party makes the policies, appoints the officials. In a rough sense, the government carries out those policies. Uh, the legislature enacts them into law, but it's there's much more of a unified leadership than that. Um, it's a, so there's, there's a division of labor, but the NPC is not sort of a separate institution that is sort of a rival to the party or to the government. Uh, it's more just uh, sort of a, a rough division of labor in that sense. That oversimplifies things a little bit. Distinguishing between policy making and implementation is never quite that cut and dry. Uh, but the fact that these meetings were being held at separate times, uh, have different functions, doesn't mean that they have any type of a tension between them or a gap between them. Okay. Well, with that in mind, I know that most of the appointments were spelled out at the meeting in the fall at the party congress, but were there any appointments announced at the recent party people's congress that were surprising or unexpected based on what people had predicted from the fall meeting. Well, you know, if you go back to that fall meeting, there were a lot of predictions that were on and off mark. Uh, and but, but so where you start from back there leads to where you're surprised today. I'd say the one uh, surprising appointment was a uh, very high performing, relatively younger party official into the post of Vice President of China, Li Yuanchao. Uh, Li has been educated in the U.S. in part, uh, has been running the organization department of the Communist Party in quite creative and interesting ways. Um, there have been rumors that he was even willing to go and look at some very sensitive party history, for example, the Tiananmen Massacre, and take a new look at it. Last November, this seemed to have stopped his rise in the hierarchy because other older members of the party did not want to revisit these uh, episodes that may cast bad light on them in their final years, and so they prevented him from rising. This is according to some accounts. You might find others. But now he's turned up chosen by somebody, at, most, at least by Xi Jinping, the new president, to be his vice president. And yet he doesn't have a role on the Politburo Standing Committee, and we're not quite sure what role Xi Jinping will endow him with as his vice president. China, uh, China's vice president doesn't come with a set of powers or, or of responsibilities. Uh, they're, they're made up as they go along. But this is one, I think, that was a, a bit of a surprise. And I have to say it's somewhat encouraging because I, having known him, having seen him in action, I think he, he represents a reformist and more uh, advanced element within the Communist Party. Yeah, Lee was also the, the, the individual that I uh, took note of as being nominated or appointed the position of vice president. Uh, up until the party congress last fall, it was widely expected that he would be on the standing committee and even rank third or fourth on that body, which would make him at the very pinnacle of power in the, in the party and therefore in the political system as a whole, uh, and didn't make it. So the speculation was, you know, why didn't he make it? Now becoming vice president indicates that, that he may have a future uh, when there is a, a new standing committee for the pilot borough appointed in four and a half years from now, he's likely to be added to it. So whereas last fall it looked like maybe his career is going to be in a dead end, uh, now it looks as though uh, uh, it will continue. And for, for people who are looking for signs of reform within China, especially political reform, uh, it's a, a positive indication. And there were some structural reforms announced um, at, the, at the Congress, including the Ministry of Railways, which has been a very powerful and 
often criticized body within China is now being gotten rid of. It's, um, its functions will go to the Ministry of Transportation and also a private company, the China Railway Corporation. How should we view this announcement? Is this just a one-time deal or is this indicative of future reforms and maybe a willingness to dismantle some of China's state-owned enterprises? You want to take that one first? Sure. Um, China repeatedly has mergers and splits of different bureaucracies and this may just be another uh, temporary merger of one ministry into another. Uh, it's often the case that even though the ministry may disappear, the people who worked within it continue working in that job. They'll just be reassigned to a, a different ministry now. Um, so this by itself doesn't indicate uh, any significant dramatic change. Uh, it's a hint and we kind of pay attention to it, uh, but by itself is a fairly routine thing of trying to streamline the bureaucracy in different ways. Um, but even though the number of ministries expands, shrinks at different times, the personnel who work within those ministries continue. Um, so the size of the bureaucracy doesn't always change, even when the number of ministries shrinks. I'd concur with that. I would just say that the Ministry of Railways was looking for punishment and it got some. Uh, whether this will be lasting punishment, all these uh, considerations have been put on the table. But the scandals, the waste, and the tremendous disasters that have been afflicting the railroads, collapsed railroads, uh, uh, major accidents, killing many people, the behavior of the ministry to try to cover up the accidents afterwards, uh, just set the public mood to demand that something be done about this, what's called in a Chinese cliche, an independent kingdom. And the cliche really fit the situation with the Ministry of Railways. Their own police, their own courts, their own telecommunication systems, uh, they just begged to have all of their adversaries come after them. Now they'll have a tussle and we'll see what the, out the upcoming uh, uh, results will be. Another structural reform that people are trying to figure out the ultimate meaning of has to do with the fate of the Family Planning Commission, which oversees China's um, so-called one-child policy. And the Family Planning Commission is being merged with the Department of Health, which has people wondering if this is the first step towards China maybe turning away from a strict family planning policy, even though the government has announced it's not going to do so. So any comments on this reform and how we should view it? Well, there, there have been hints about China either reforming or perhaps even abandoning the one-child policy, especially after the 2010 cons census got released, uh, where it really became clear that the population, kind of the demographic balance has changed within the country. Uh, and the number of, of workers coming into the workforce has been declining, the large number of, of old and retired people who now need state support or their children's support in their old age has been growing. Um, so there's been some thought, ironically, that maybe this policy has been too successful, uh, that they've changed the balance too much. Uh, typically you have a more of a pyramid-shaped uh, distribution of, of your age with the smallest, oldest at the top, a much wider number of young people at the bottom. China's developed more of a pear-shaped uh, population balance, which skews things and has tremendous social impact down the road. Um, and so this may be some indication, but by itself uh, not a full uh, uh, convincing and lasting decision to modify it. Uh, there's been talk about it for a while. Uh, they've been loosening it in a variety of ways, uh, but they're still worried that if they fully abandon the policy, uh, the potential expansion of the population uh, would, might go out of control. Um, so it was a curious and interesting decision, um, but exactly what it means for the future still remains to be seen. As China urbanizes, um, the consequences of a government change in policy are shrinking. Mm. Uh, that's because as you, if you look around Asia generally, wherever you've got an urban population, whether it's a Singapore, or Hong Kong, or Taiwan, or Korea, Families that have to squeeze themselves into small apartments in congested cities choose to have one child. And, they, and very seldom do you see them get up as, as high as two per family. The 
numbers are usually 1.2, 1.3 fertility rates throughout the region. And I would expect China will end up there as well. Now, China does have a larger rural population than elsewhere, so you may see some growth in the rural population. But I think on, on balance, this is a policy debate that won't have much consequence. Much more important would be, for example, reform of the household registry system. That would have much more consequence for the economy. We may want to talk about that later. Um, one of the reform messages that people have been a lot paying a lot of attention to was the speech by Premier Li Keqiang. Uh, as Dr. Paul mentioned, he's going to be heading up the economy. So people have been trying to parse his um, first press conference for clues about <laughs> what he's going to do on issues such as the hukou policy, um, reorganizing state enterprises. Could you pick out some of the themes that you saw in that speech and kind of read the tea leaves, so to speak, on what they might mean for China's future economic policies? Uh, if I could summarize the themes, it is to lower people's expectations. Um, he uh, follows a premier who talked big and did little in the eyes of most Chinese. Maybe 10 years or 20 years from now, we'll look back and say, he did more than we thought when Jiabao was more consequential. But the former, the former premier has left office under a, under a cloud of scandal and with many people thinking he and his party chief partner underperformed the last few years at least, maybe the last 10 years. And so he, I think, uh, coming in, Li Keqiang, who has um, uncomfortable roots in the current leadership lash-up, uh, as a someone who comes out of the party youth league, uh, ha, but who's a genuine economist and, and quite scholarly and knowledgeable official, married to a prominent professor, um, and modest means. Uh, he's trying to send the message of modesty and low expectations, and uh, he hit on the themes of you have to address the environment. China in the last year has become obsessed, and with good reason, with the deteriorating condition of their environment, especially on the East Coast urban areas. And, uh, and, and he's also sort of said, we're going to move forward with reform, but he's not trying to scare people with the scale of reform. And the, uh, the speeches that are given at these major national meetings are less like the State of the Union address in the United States, where the individual leader is laying out his priorities. It's much more like a party platform, where you sort of convey a consensus of what the top leadership's are concerned about. And as Doug mentioned before, this is really much, this meeting was much more about personnel sort of laying out broad parameters but not really getting into specific details. So we talked about the need to, to do something about corruption, do something about the environment, uh, do something about inequality. Um, but these are issues that have been discussed and, and prioritized for years without a lot of detail put into it. Uh, it probably won't be until this fall, the next meeting of the Central Committee, that if there is any policy teeth to these things, that's when it will be revealed. Of course, the other speech that everyone was paying close attention to was the first public address by Xi Jinping after he was formally um, announced to be China's president. Mm -hmm. And he seems to have chosen his, his new political catchphrase, uh, the China dream, which has been explained as everything from raising the standard of living for average Chinese people to the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, uh, which of course means different things to different people. So I wonder if you could help us parse through this short but very dense phrase, the China dream, and what it might actually mean in terms of what Xi's government will try to accomplish. Well, I, I listened to the speech um, appearing on Chinese national television and then was asked what I thought the Chinese dream was. And I said, listening to the speech, I really don't have a good idea what the Chinese dream is. And I was accused by the other commentators of not having good ears because <laughs> they clearly heard what the Chinese dream was. Uh, and in the last week, the Chinese have published um, in the People's Daily newspaper seven successive commentaries attempting to say what the Chinese dream is. I'm still a little bit confused. I mean, you can find what you want in it. It's like political speech here. We had hope and change and, you know, we, and that sort of thing in the, in the campaign in 2008. And, something else in 2012 and we'll have it for, and it's, it's, you said symbols. Um, the dominant uh, meme coming out of American media has chosen to interpret the China dream as a strong ar country and, a, and a, str excuse me, a, a rich country and a strong army. And that's, people are saying well, this portends much more military confrontation. I didn't hear that in the speech. I saw a China which will be tough, 
defending its interests if it feels they're being impinged upon. But I didn't see a China that says we're going to go out and take over this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and so I would discourage any of your listeners who might uh, think that maybe the New York Times has got this right, that this march, it's a new march by a new uh, right-wing militarist government. I, that, that's not there. But what is there is not uh, that clear to me. Maybe it is to you, Chris. Uh, it's, it's not that much clear to me either, because it's largely sort of getting a phrase that's identifiable with him, just as the previous presidents had a phrase that was identifiable with them. Uh, the previous two presidents chose a phrase that had Confucian origins to kind of forget about ideology and Marxism as a basis for legitimacy and harken back to China's own history and traditions. Uh, the Chinese dream in the sense of, of uh, aspiring to uh, more wealth for the country, sort of a national rejuvenation, uh, as you mentioned, uh, itself kind of goes back to a, a century ago about, about trying to build up China. Um, but exactly what it means will be fleshed out in, in the coming months. A lot of times these phrases get put out there uh, before they're actually fully detailed. And so that'll come as we go along. What it's not, as far as I can tell, is it's not an equivalent of the American dream. This is not an idea that through individual hard work and initiative, you can be, as an individual, you can become successful. It's much more about a collective sense of rejuvenation and prosperity and less about sort of individual uh, success. Um, most of the China watchers and people paying attention to the MPC were looking at it through the question of potential reform, both political and economic. Um, what are the chances of reform? What signs is the new government giving that it might be willing to reform? So based on the announcements made, the speeches given by the Premier and the President, what are you feeling about the possibility of reform and the chances of it being carried out? You know, I, I, we've been saying, in, in essence, that this was not about policy, this was about personnel and structure. And if I, my evaluation of the personnel appointments and the structural adjustments is uh, reform is going to have a rough patch. Um, the, the rhetoric is there, it has been for some time. The need for reform, is it transparent? Mm -hmm. But the congestion of reform and vested interests and the conflict between the two demonstrated itself in the appointments and the structural adjustments that were made. As I said earlier, agri the railroad ministry was a target for being thumped, but many more organizations that should have been put in their place were not, if the reformers were going to implement a reform agenda and needed a structural base to do it. And then if you look at the personnel, we have a person who's identified uh, with reform in the form of the premier, Li Keqiang, um, and his deputy, who is the executive vice premier in charge of the economy day to day, is actually a guy, Zhang Gaoli, who uh, comes out of Tianjin, where he was famously the one of the two or three biggest exponents in China of vast capital investment. Build a towers and then hope they get filled up and make money someday. Uh, and use the free money available from the banking system and the government to invest in these things. Take care of your friends. The old way of doing business. Now, in the last two days, Zhang has made a speech saying, I'm all for reform, I'm going to do everything. But there's nothing in his history that suggests he's anything but more in favor of a rhetorical kind of reform. And that's where the test will be, the, rub, you know, the American phrase, the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. You know, people are sort of looking at whether Xi Jinping himself or Li Keqiang is, is individuals or the reform oriented, what will they do, which sort of exaggerates their own authority to, to really have uh, a complete say over what what the party or the government does. Uh, there's now sort of a growing set of interests, both within the government, within the state of enterprises, uh, that kind of inhibit dramatic reform. Because uh, if people are benefiting so much for the current set of policies, especially since the financial crisis, the shifting of resources and priorities to the state-owned enterprises, uh, that's a very powerful group. Uh, and they've been resistant to uh, discussion of reprioritizing where investment goes. Uh, they, they're not particularly enthusiastic about limiting the amount of investment in infrastructure, in roads and, and railroads and the power grid. Um, but most economists, especially Chinese economists, would argue they've pretty much done all they can do in that regard. Now they've got to find some other way of, of reorienting their economy to make it more sustainable. But you've got a powerful interest who are resisting doing it because they benefit from the current set of policies and will likely lose out if there is a reorientation. 
so whether or not the current leadership, even if they want to, will be able to shift gears uh, is going to be a real challenge for them. Sure. And before we close, I'd like to touch briefly on what the new leadership might mean for China's foreign policy. Uh, in addition to having Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang take their positions, we also saw uh, Yang Jiechi be appointed mm -hmm. state counselor in who will be in charge of the foreign ministry. And uh, he's very familiar with the United States. And then uh, Wang Yi will be the new uh, foreign minister. And he's very familiar with Japan. So people are trying to read from these appointments what China's foreign policy uh, priorities are going to be. And I wonder if you could help us figure that out. I think it's remarkably strange that after a series of years, since 2008 really, China has seen its general environment deteriorate and the team that supervised it is being promoted. Um, they either don't care or they like the tension in the neighborhood. They have seen their grip on Myanmar loosened, uh, North Korea being uh, uh, insolent and disobedient, um, Vietnam. Philippines, other Southeast Asian nations are either in a state of pretty high tension, and in Japan, of course, in a state of fairly high tension or certainly distancing themselves from China. And yet all of these places are deeply ingrained into the Chinese supply chain for the export industries that support the world's manufacturers. Uh, this is really a very strange set of appointments in, in the sense that Yang Jiechi has been put in the, this position. My guess is his position is not the top position. Um, the information is not firm, but what I'm seeing is a movement toward placing a man named Wang Huning, who has been running the China Central Committee Party Policy Office for the last uh, years, uh, into a stronger position of, men, of, of coordinating foreign policy. The promotion of Wang Yi into the foreign ministry I think is a very positive thing because he's had a terrific track record in a series of posts. I've known him in all of these posts and he's an extremely able diplomat and probably will prove to be a more able diplomat than his predecessor. Um, but the message from the Chinese leadership is basically things have been all right. We didn't have to bring anybody in and change the mix of leaders in the foreign policy apparatus. So they tend to say more of the same. Yeah, if you want to look at some indication of a sign of the new leadership looking to improve relations with the United States, the fact that President Xi's first visit is to Russia uh, is not a, not a particularly promising sign. Um, and the people who have been named to these top positions in the foreign, the foreign policy area uh, are also people who are not politically, politically powerful. None of, neither of them are on the Politburo, which is really where decisions get made. Uh, whether they will be members of the more informal small groups that really decide major policies remain to be seen, or if they're simply spokesmen and carry out policies made elsewhere, which is what many people usually assume, um, that's going to be the thing that we'll be looking for as we go forward. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for an engaging and enlightening discussion. I'm sure our viewers will enjoy it. And thank you to our audience for joining us on China Forum, and we will see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.